Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Beyond Hourly podcast, hosted by Omni Ridgeway, one of the world's most experienced dispute funders and enforcement specialists. Our podcast focuses on commercial disputes around the globe and innovative ways to maximize value for clients and law firms. Episodes of this podcast can be found on our website, omnibridgeway.com, iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks. We welcome you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us reviews. My name is Jim Batson, and I'm your host for today's podcast. I'm a senior investment manager and head of Omni Bridgeway's New York office. Prior to joining Omni Bridgeway, I was a commercial litigator and partner at a boutique law firm. My role at Omni Bridgeway involves assessing investment opportunities and serving as a strategic resource for the parties we fund throughout the funding relationship. I'm delighted to host a two part podcast series featuring Ariana Tadler, founding partner of Tadler Law. Among other things, Ariana is an incredibly accomplished litigator in the complex litigation and class action arena, as well as a world renowned authority in the field of e discovery. She also is a founding principal of Meta e Discovery a data hosting, management, and consulting company. Today's episode will explore Ariana's experience launching a law firm and advice she has for others tempted to hang their own shingle. Our second episode in the series will focus on Ariana's advocating for consumers and investors against corporate fraud, her insights about running a woman-owned, woman-led law firm, and how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting access to justice. Ariana, welcome to the Beyond Hourly podcast. We're delighted to have you appear on two episodes. Thanks for having me. This is really a great opportunity to connect with you. Yes, uh, and that's a great segue here to how we know each other. Our, our paths have crossed in fun uh, interesting, and interesting ways. I, I was thinking before the, the podcast today, we first met when we were together at Fordham Law School. I was a legal writing TA and uh, you were the TA supervisor. So I think I technically reported to you at that time. That may have been true. That sounds pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) I think it was probably a little less formal than that, but it was a great program that Fordham had in position so that the students, as they were moving through the system, had the opportunity to both teach and learn simultaneously. Yeah, I will say my blue book skills were enhanced incredibly by being required to help correct you know, the submissions that the other students had put in for the class that, that I was the TA for. And that made me a stickler for Blue Book stuff, which was never the kind of person I was. But you know, once you've been in that role, it's hard to stop. Agreed. But then, and then after that, I think um, we were a floor apart from one another when we both worked at separate law firms here in the city, right? That's right. Um, I think we had one particular day where the elevator doors opened and we looked <laughs> But oh, hi. And that led to um, various random opportunities where that would happen. I haven't worked on the East Side in such a long time. So that's a, a good memory. I like that. Yeah, here, here. And then I think we sort of reconnected more, more regularly uh, when we both had some pretty well known e discovery cases pending before Judge Shira Shinlin in the Southern District of New York back in 2006, 2007, 2008 timeframe. I know um, I had a case that was kind of a perfect storm if, for people in the e-discovery world called uh, Zubalake against UBS. I think Judge Shinlin was anxious to have an opportunity to convey to the legal world her views, her very well-informed views on uh, e-discovery. And I just happened to serve up a case where there were a lot of e-discovery disputes back when those were pretty unknown. But You had a case uh, before Judge Shinlin about the same time, too, that also was a big factor in the e-discovery world. Is that right? I did. Um, I actually was um, appointed as plaintiff's coordinating counsel in the IPO securities litigation, which started in the very early 2000s, 2001 period, and related to 309 different class actions that ended up being coordinated together. It was mostly against companies that were in the tech space around the time of what was referred to as the the tech bubble. And there were also 55 investment banks that were defendants. So we had e-discovery issues that really were very unique and different to what people were accustomed to in that federal securities fraud arena. And so I considered myself very privileged to have had those years before Judge Shinlin because she was so knowledgeable 
about this area and also was very intent on, you know, letting the world know about this area. And then your case came along while we were still in the throes of discovery and you were making really phenomenal law, which was great because it, it opened up this field and led more and more practitioners to understand the significance of electronic and digital information in the context of a court case. Yeah, it was it was quite a time. I mean, they were, you know, they were leading up to amending the federal rules of civil procedure, I think, to do away with one of the one of the terms that was like phonographic recordings or something along those lines. If you think about like an amendment from the 1930s to the 2000s, where, you know, you did now have email and all the other electronic discovery. It was it was really groundbreaking at the time. You know, there've been I think there's been at least one set of amendments, if not more since then, which are more refined. But I remember it was a big shift in, in the discovery world in the U.S. at the time. Right. That was actually the first time. Um, so the 2006 amendments, obviously the process starts far earlier before the amendments become effective. And that was the first time that I re ever really learned anything or understood how the amendment process works, how the Federal Civil Rules Advisory Committee works. I commented on the proposed amendments at the time and then became a very active formal observer going to the meetings for the advisory committee and the standing committee all the way through the most recent discovery package, which became effective in 2015. And since that time, have personally been appointed by Chief Justice Roberts to sit on the Federal Civil Rules Advisory Committee. So I'm currently fulfilling my term doing that. Wow, that's impressive. I remember our paths crossing from time, more than from time to time, pretty regularly for about a year or so thereafter, as we spoke before a lot of the same entities on, on e-discovery issues. But I, I only did that for a short period of time, but I think you've become incredibly involved and, and has actually led to you know, what's become an important part of your career. Is, is that right? Yes, absolutely. I, I would say that when you and I were crossing paths, it was almost like we were on the circuit right? Running around and, and speaking at various conferences. Since that time, you've obviously taken a very important different path in your career, which is so exciting. And for me, I decided that that was an area that I wanted to really embrace and make it be a very vital part of what I do every day. So I am a full service litigator, but I also have a specialization when necessary in the field of discovery. We say e-discovery, although most discovery today is e-discovery. You're dealing with whether it's email or Word documents or text messages or social media or, you know, whatever application you might be wearing or using in your home from Alexa to your iWatch to your Fitbit. I've just enjoyed that part of my practice because I love litigating and I love all the procedural aspects of litigation, including gearing towards trial. I also love identifying the information that is going to enable you to prosecute your claim or defend your claim. And, and Ariana, you just pretty recently launched your own firm, which, you know, I just take my hat off. That's an incredible undertaking. Um, I was so happy to see it. I, I think it's fantastic. And definitely would like to spend some time <clears throat> today talking to our listeners about what that's about. And, and maybe we could start at the beginning, sort of what made you decide to start your own firm? Why did you do that? So um, I was at a really important time in my own personal life in that I felt that I had built my own brand and wanted to be able to really enforce that brand and build upon it in a way that was not structured so much by a much larger firm structure. You know, I really considered myself privileged to be able to work with so many of the same people for well over 20 years of my career. However, by the time I launched my own firm, Tadler Law, that was in June of 2019. And it was just shortly after my eldest son graduated from college and my youngest son had just completed his first year in college. And both of my children, when my husband and I told them what we were going to be doing, that I was going to be making this transition, they both said, I think almost in, in, in synchrony, mom, is there ever a time when you'll rest? Is there ever a time? <laughs> You would just kind of sit back. You've got one of us out and independent and the other is now, you know, in college. It's an empty nest for you and dad. 
And I said, you know what, it's almost like the perfect time to do this, because it means that I need to fill in some of that gap, too. I felt very strongly uh, during the course of my career, which has been very intense and involves a lot of travel apps and COVID. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit later. But there was a lot of time that I spent focused on my children. And I adore my children. They're great young men. I also want to make sure that I am continuing to be true to myself, continuing to represent people who need strong lawyers with strong vision, who are armed up for what is involved in the litigations that we do, whether they be class actions or complex litigation. Uh, We also now do contract negotiation. We've had people come to us because they're departing from one organization and going to another. They need some facilitation there. And so it's been an exciting time to be more free thinking and more open about the kind of skill sets that over all these years I was able to develop. I see your point. You know, there are certain, I don't know, inflection points in our lives where we realize I can make a change. Sometimes it's forced on us, you know, by external circumstances, whatever might be going on in your current role. But other times, you know, you just sort of find that that opportunity. Certainly, you know, for me, switching from being a litigator for 20 years to getting into commercial litigation finance was a was a huge leap. And it was, you know, somewhat similar. I mean, it was partly a function of what was going on in the world of litigation generally and how things were were changing right around 2008 or the after effects of 2008. But it was also just a point where it's like, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. Is this something I want to keep doing as a, a litigator or do I want to try something new? So in that way, I can relate, but in not, not in other ways. I didn't start my own business. And that's really, uh, that's really incredible. I can't imagine it's been exactly what you expected. I'm not even sure what your expectations were, <laughs> but I'll still ask, you know, how has it been different than you expected? Tell us about sort of unexpected developments or, or what have you. It's, a, it's an incredible process that I'm sure a lot of lawyers have thought about doing, but a far fewer have actually done. But many people are probably thinking about it right now. I think there are so many elements that were unexpected. And yet one of the things that anybody who's going to launch a new business should know, especially if they're leaving an organization that they've been affiliated with for a significant period of time, is that at some point, you're just going to have to take the leap. You, you can think that you're going to plan and plan and plan and have it all beautifully scoped so that you walk out the door and walk into your new door and everything's going to be set up perfectly. It doesn't quite work that way. And I again, I really did have the privilege of working with some so many amazing people at my prior firm for well over two decades. And I had become very accustomed to having this extensive, very qualified and competent staff, whether it be an entire paralegaling department, word processing department, secretaries, an accounting department, an investigation department, and then, you know, having tiers of lawyers doing a variety of different types of cases, also fulfilling certain um, procedural aspects of a particular litigation. When I launched my firm, it was really just with a handful of people. We're a small firm. We're very nimble. We're very flexible. And that's good that we're very nimble and we're very flexible because in addition to now litigating our cases, all of that back office, accounting, how you manage finances, how you are negotiating your contracts with the various service providers that you need separate and apart from your service providers for litigation, service providers that allow any kind of organization, company, law firm run from what provider are you going to use for your cell phone service? Are you going to use Office 365? To what kind of file system, uh, you know, virtual file system or case management system are you going to use? What kind of billing system are you going to use to manage all of the hours that the attorneys and the paralegals and case managers are billing? That was a lot of research. We did choose to go outside of just our our brains. My main partner, AJ DeBartolomeo, is very well equipped in this arena. And Shiva Makan, whom I know you you've met and know, she had been my executive assistant for nearly 14 years. And she we just recently promoted her to director of operations and administrative services. She's phenomenal at fostering relationships and identifying places where savings can be and also ensuring that you get the services that you want and need and not pay for things that you don't. 
having the ability to kind of look outside and, and identify places where we needed help was very important. We did hire a consultant to come in and help facilitate some of that work. And then, as I said, Sheba and AJ did a lot of work, as did I. We, you know, we spent many nights and weekends working on that back office part while simultaneously moving our cases because our clients and cases that had been in our respective inventory followed us. And so there was no time to skip a beat. We had to get going right away as if, you know, yesterday was no different than today, or I should say today is no different than yesterday in that wherever we left off yesterday, we had to keep going. And so that really ended up, I think, being the biggest challenge was prioritizing our time, making sure we were getting all of our case responsibilities handled, making sure we were connected with our clients, achieving the results for them that they had come to expect and that we expected of ourselves, and making sure that we were also building the firm's infrastructure. And I have to say, one of the things I'm proudest of is that when we did launch the firm, we made a decision to invest in the best technology, which little did we know that less than a year in, we would be asking our employees to work remotely or recommending that they do. When we did that in March, on March 14th, we did so seamlessly. There really was no transition period because we already had all the technology in place to do it. And that was something that I, by the grace of God, I, you know, I'm very, very thankful that that was what we had made a choice about in terms of investing in ourselves. Yeah, I think prior to COVID, I've never appreciated how important a good internet connection was. <laughs> I thought it mattered a lot to me then before. And now it's like, you can't live without, you know, the best possible Wi-Fi. But I know you're talking about a lot more than that. And it's impressive. And you, I forget, you must have felt like you were making 100 decisions a day sometimes. I mean, it's like so many small things that you wouldn't normally have to decide, you had to decide. Yes, yes. There were so many things that I, I think I did take for granted, and I don't mean to be negative in that context, but rather I had come to expect that there were just people who handled all of these things. And I was so happy to rely upon them to do that at my old firm and suddenly to have to make these decisions and to make choices. So making decisions is one thing. I think there's a distinction between making a decision and making a choice. So, you know, sometimes when you have a decision that's binary, yes, no. Okay. That's not that difficult, assuming you've done your homework. But when it's yes, no, we want this kind of technology or yes, no, we want to go down this path. That's only the beginning because then once you go down the path or choose that type of technology, well, what are your options? Okay, well, we're talking about a type of technology or, or a business service. One offers A through C, another one offers B, C and E, another one offers B and F. And so you're trying to figure out what's the right choice. And it comes back to what I said earlier in response to one of your questions, Jim, at some point, sometimes you just have to make a leap and say, we're going to try it this way and see if that works. And I will say that, you know, I am very proud of the decisions we made about technology. There are some choices that we made in the beginning in launching the firm that we have since transitioned. We're now well past our one year anniversary. And so contracts were coming due for renewal. And we had the opportunity during COVID to spend some time that we didn't really have before, but to drill down what was working, what wasn't, and realize that we were in a position that was well leveraged in terms of a service provider wanting us to stay with them, other providers wanting our business, and being able to spend some time thinking, well, you know, that product didn't really work so well for us, or there were some bells and whistles that were missing what else were we looking for? So we've used this time very productively to determine what are the things that we need and are essential to our day-to-day? -day, what are things that are our wants and which wants are really worth it and which wants should kind of still sit there on the desk and we're gonna think about them some more and see if they really make sense for us in terms of an investment of money. Sounds like it really highlights how important it is to focus on the process, the decision-making process, and then having confidence in the decision-making process because you could second-guess yourself forever, I imagine. Yes. And the other thing too, which is one of the core values for us at Tadler Law is inclusion. 
And what I mean by that is we really want to hear the voices of all participants. So I might look at a particular service or product that we're using and think it's great. And I'm only using three aspects of functionality. And meanwhile, three other people are using that and they're using 10 aspects of functionality and they're sitting there thinking, this is terrible. It doesn't do anything that I want it to do other than the three things that Ariana's happy with. You know, I think that in some organizations, people would sit quietly and not get into the conversation because the person whose name is on the door seems satisfied. And for us, we have pushed very, very hard to really encourage everybody to have a voice and speak up about anything and everything that's working or not working. And I think that is a huge difference in being in a smaller organization than a larger organization. We actually have worked with a facilitator. I worked with an executive coach for more than 10 years personally, and I arranged for him to come in and uh, actually facilitate a half day meeting. We did an outdoor, socially distanced outdoor meeting where he facilitated um, discussion around how do we communicate? Are we communicating well or are we missing certain opportunities that would enable us to be that much more efficient and effective? And that process is still ongoing. We did that in September. And now we're in the second phase of some additional exercises that we're working on with the hope of completing them before year end. So we can think about how we're going to facilitate part of our new vision for 2021. I'm dying to get to talking more about your actual practice now, but before we do, do you have any words of wisdom for somebody who might be considering starting uh, his or her own firm? Absolutely. You have to tap into your networks that already exist and you have to identify other networks. So I had some colleagues that are actually competitors of mine in the spaces that I work primarily in one particular area. And when I was thinking about whether to maybe go to another firm or launch my own firm, I had one particular colleague initially who said, you need to take this leap and we are all going to be here for you. I was not prepared for that answer. And I thought, my gosh, we compete for business every day. And these people have been phenomenal resources. You know, you, you start going down a path and you're thinking, oh, this might work for my business and you're not sure. And you just pick up the phone and ask them, hey, did you try this product or did you think about using this marketing tool? And they'll tell you straight up, yes, no, don't do this, call this person. So a real blessing was somebody who introduced me to this great organization called Women Own Law. And it's an organization made up, obviously, of women who either own their own law firms or they are owners of service providers in the legal industry in some fashion. And the really great part of this organization is that there is a New York chapter. It's also a national organization. And you have access to all of these amazingly talented visionaries, women, very, very excited and enthusiastic about what they're doing and really keyed in to sharing their network and working together. And what I love is when I go to a meeting, whether in person before COVID or now, even virtually, I am surrounded by women who are not my competitors. They are women who do all sorts of different things. And as a result, that network becomes this really hearty place where somebody is looking for this type of attorney or this type of service provider, and we're all recommending each other. And they thankfully have also created, you know, a good listserv so that we're able to communicate whether we're having a meeting or not, when we're looking to either help somebody or we need some help. And it became a great resource for me too, even on some of the decisions that we were making in growing the firm, just hiring certain people, people who were just so absolutely impressive that we thought these are great people that we want to be working with. I, I love your emphasis on, on networking there because it's a term that people throw around, but it's when you make a career change or if something significant happens, it's when you really at least I've found, it's when I really come to appreciate the relationships with everybody. You know, you pointed out how you got a lot of assistance from competitors in your in your space. It's true. It's made me realize that it really business life, they're, they're so intertwined. It's all about relationships. 
whatever side of the V or wherever you're doing, if you're fostering relationships and helping each other out, that, that sounds like, you know, you really hit the nail on the head and, and you're fortunate to have found such a great organization too, to be able to broaden your network. You know, certainly it's one thing to reach into your own, but broadening it, that really rings true. As I mentioned at the outset, this is the first episode in a two-part series featuring Ariana. We welcome you to tune in for part two and hear more about Ariana's practice, the trends she's seeing as courts manage their dockets in the era of COVID-19, and other topics. Episodes of the Beyond Hourly podcast can be found on our website, omnibridgeway.com, iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks, and I invite you to subscribe and leave us reviews. You can also access a transcript of this podcast on our website blog page. Please feel free to follow up with me, Jim Batson, at jbatson at omnibridgeway.com for any feedback, ideas, or insights you have on topics we should cover on the podcast. Thank you for listening.